So welcome everyone to this webinar for August and I'll just bring up the front slide for today. So today we're having a research fireside chat. My name's Wendy Tallio and I'm your host today and I've got Heek uh, monitoring the chat window and Colin's, <clears throat> Colin's also my co-anchor today. So this webinar is going to have two parts. The first part is an open mic sort of sharing your research and we currently have oh, about three, six, seven people lined up so it'll be short and sharp and if we do run out of time then uh, your details will be shared on the forum and any slides that you've got and we'll, we'll be able to have a, a conversation there after this webinar. Uh, I would remind people that because of the time we want to get as many people as possible talking so question and answers will probably go over into the Moodle uh, forum after this. Part two will be uh, discussing these two questions. What are the research needs of this community and what research could benefit uh, advisors most? So be prepared to get your mics on and chatting for part two. So having said that, uh, there's just a couple of community announcements that, that I thought I'd include for this webinar. Uh, we currently got over 380 members in Moodle. Of course, not all of them are active, uh, but it's fantastic to see people continuing to sign up there. Uh, we will, we're looking at having a logo design competition coming up shortly, so keep your eyes out for details of that. Uh, at Ascolite Conference in December in Singapore, we'll be looking at having a meet-up there for people on site and off. And uh, above all, just, you know, welcome to the community and please keep using the discussion forums to uh, connect with the community. So we have, uh, like I said, about seven people to present. So what I'd like to do uh, is just have a volunteer for going first. If you can hit the hands, raise hand for those that are presenters. Okay, Christine, thank you. Uh, you can lower your hand. So Bridget, you'll be second. And if you give me a minute, I will get Christine's slides up. Okay, over to you, Christine. Uh, Christine, I'll just un you'll need to unmute yourself. Thanks, that's better, isn't it? It is, great. Well, hello, everybody. I was just asked to share for a few minutes about some ongoing research that we've been doing over the last couple of years about exploring learning designer roles, um, particularly in Australian universities. And um, I just wanted to update you on what we've been doing since we did a national survey of learning designers. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, we um, surveyed directors of teaching and learning units and also learning designers, and we had 103 learning designers answer our reasonably extensive um, survey about what they actually do, what sort of roles they take, how are they employed at universities, etc. Um, so we've done the first thing if you can see on the slide in the orange box, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our thinking of how we see learning designers and how we're sort of shaping that in the work that we've been doing. And you may be aware of the third space professional writing um, that's been in literature for a while, but I just wanted to say that it stood out that learning designers are obviously highly collaborative the way that learning designers possess strong agency and take responsibility for their own and others' professional development is quite a striking point and that they always have been on a personal journey. And I think that's something that directors and people in employment need to understand. And another interesting part was the fact that 
they don't just climb silos of university employment um, like the structures, but they're actually people who enjoy um, sort of a, a lateral kind of career progression perhaps and take different jobs because of the interest that they have in them or some strategic way. So they, they don't think of employment and promotion necessarily as much as the same way as universities think of it. And just the, the last one there about being change agents and critical in supporting sustained change in teaching and learning in higher education. So um, we did quite a bit of dissemination. Um, obviously, we presented to the funder in March 2018, which was KDAD now Colts. And I've just put the link up there if you want to look at what we said. I also took a poster overseas to the HEA Advanced HE um, com Annual Conference. And it was also taken to the QES at Sunshine Coast in September. I've just recently spoken about the showcase presentation at Herzer in Auckland, and it was quite well received there. And I do actually have those slides. They haven't put them up, but I'm happy to share them with anyone who might want to have a look. We have actually finally, we've actually had trouble submitting um, the paper for publication in the sense that the people we thought would be interested in publishing it weren't. <laughs> So we've actually written it up as a full paper for Ascolite in 2019. So we're just waiting to hear whether they um, have accepted that or not. That will be all about the survey and what actually happened. I must say there has been quite a number of informal professional conversations about this. So, um, for example, in our own university, at the University of Queensland, um, the director of the Teaching and Learning Unit has already engaged someone to be looking at professional development for learning designers, so how we can improve what they need in their job. So that's been very exciting and has, has taken on some of the other ideas from it. Also from Shelley Kanash from the University of Southern Queensland has talked quite a bit with her learning designers about um, what we found in this work. And I know that the directors at Colt were very interested in what they could do to try and help, particularly in professional development, um, to make things a little bit easier. And just lastly, there's just the implications are still ongoing, but it's good for us to be able to have conversations about this. It, it's um, learning designers do lots of variable work. No one, no two are the same. So they've got porous boundaries and they do overlap other people's roles quite a lot, as you probably know. Um, We've been talking a bit around senior roles and other ways that people could be involved in um, having um, more complex um, roles rather than just managing people. So um, it's been interesting. I think it's a very strong practice interest and I'm very happy to sort of continue advocating this as wherever I can and I hope that it helps you in some way. So if you need to want to talk about anything, just my email's on the bottom of the slide and I'm very happy to have a chat. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Christine. That's great. So if there's uh, questions for Christine, please put them in the chat now or uh, in the Moodle forum uh, later on. So next up is Bridget and she's just going to talk to us. Over to you, Bridget. So um, my name is Bridget and I'm very uh, new to research and uh, actually really like uh, what Christine just presented because it uh, leads into what I want to do. I'm about to complete my, uh, or want to complete my master's by research uh, project and the research question that I'm hoping to look at is how do people become learning designers? Because uh, as um, Christine's work shows, that we all have such varied backgrounds, but we also do such varied things. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed in being a learning designer is that uh, we all come from different uh, backgrounds and what made us actually become learning designers? How do we find out about the role? And my so what in this is basically to uh, guide recruiting of learning designers and um, have some standards for what a learning designer is, as well as um, how do we professionally develop learning designers uh, as well. And my particular area will be uh, higher education learning designers. 
and even the definition of what a learning designer is. So I'm, I was, I came across the work by um, Christine and others, and uh, that basically led me onto this sort of path. But I've only just begun, so this is really just tentative steps. Uh, at looking at and thinking about my research questions and problems. So I'll be very interested also to hear from people um, in the next part of this session about what uh, research do we need and whether this fits in with that. And that's really it. So I know it's very short, but that's all I really had to say and just wanted to get some input from uh, this community. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bridget. That's that's great, and it's certainly I was just nodding my head, going, "Yep, yeah, yeah." It it's going to hit a lot of uh, people in this community. So I'm certainly hope that people can get back to you if you want to put your details or some contact details in the chat, and sure. uh, and also keep an eye out on the Moodle forum. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Bridget. We might go Jenny, and then Irina, and then Sarah. So one moment, Jenny, and I'll put your slides up. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Jenny. Um, so the project I'm working on is um, uh, basically to do with uh, the work of education design teams, uh, mainly in higher ed context, but also um, in, the, in, in the industry, specifically um, some of the RTOs um, that we have um, in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and next next slide, please, Wendy. <laughs> um, so um, I'm currently uh, researching in the same centre as Colin um, at the University of Sydney, so the Centre for Research um, on Learning and Innovation, and I'm supervised by Peter Goodyear and um, Linda Markskaite. And um, next slide, please, Wendy. <laughs> Um, so this is a um, study on um, cross-disciplinary teams um, across Australian universities and, as I said, the RTOs. And um, what I'm currently seeing is there is very little empirical research on the process of design for learning um, in teams specifically. Um, so we all do it across different universities. Um, however, it's really hard to find um, empirical studies on how we actually do it. And so that's what's prompted me to jump into this particular uh, research. Um, well, I am also looking at um, how we use and create artifacts as part of our uh, learning design work. Um, and also how the artifacts then in turn influence how we design. So a symbiotic relationship, I suppose, with um, the material um, in, our, in our work. Um, and so what I'm exploring is how we in work with artifacts um, in teams. Um, next slide, please. So I've got two research questions at the moment that I'm exploring. Um, what role do objects and artifacts play in the design process um, in the technology enhanced learning team or education design team? And how do objects and artifacts help a team to progress through the work? Next slide, please. Um, so, so far I've progressed about halfway through uh, the research cycle. Um, I've completed my thesis proposal and I'm working with um, one organization in terms of data collection. And I'm looking for future participants if anybody's interested. Um, so any learning design teams involved in um, education design work in higher education industry would be great. Um, I've got some initial data analysis. So um, I'm currently coding uh, with Envivo and I'm writing. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so why 
why this research? Um, Would you like to just do a summary to finish up? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, which slide um, would you like to go to? Seven? So the next one, please. Um, yes. Lessons so, learned. Yeah, just yes. yeah. 10 seconds on this. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Um, so basically, uh, what we do with artifacts is a really important component of um, how we work. Um, and I'm also seeing learning design as an emerging process. Um, so what's happening is we kind of need a continuous assessment of the environment uh, to successfully progress things to whatever desired outcome that we have planned. Um, and the last point I want to make is we really need a common language and a framework for sharing our specialized knowledge, um, expertise and experience. And I'm seeing this uh, more and more as I work with different teams. So I might, I might stop there, Wendy, uh, for the sake of time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that's a great presentation and there's obviously more details there. Uh, if you would like to share your slides in the Moodle site, uh, that would be welcome as well. And yeah, keep the round of applause going as we fire through these uh, presentations today. Thanks, Jenny, and you can, uh, you know, feel free to join the chat, of course. So, Irina. Thanks, uh, Irina, you're up. I'll just share your slides. Hi. So you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. So that's your single slide. Away you go. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. And um, uh, I think my presentation is going to kind of link in a little bit to what other people have been talking about. I've um, had the uh, pleasure of um, having a lot of support from people from Ascolite and also uh, the Theta uh, conference uh, community and um, who've been a big big players uh, in conducting this research which is just coming to an end. I'm just writing up the findings and the conclusions at the moment. Um, I'm doing a PhD at Flinders University and uh, this has been my project since about 2014. I started off with the problem of looking at how do we actually overcome the silos that Jenny's mentioned, um, the silos that exist in between those who are the people who come up with these great ways of using technology and the people um, who then go and adopt it in their own teaching practice. So. Um, the research problem is very much about straddling the chasm between uh, these silos. I came up with a new me uh, res research methodology, which I've called interpretive case-based modelling. I won't go into the details here, but it's basically looking at case studies, which have been the traditional way of doing this kind of research and building models. And uh, so there's uh, two parts uh, to the building of the model. First is looking at existing case studies, which create um, what the framework of the model looks like and then going to real people and getting their lived experiences. So connecting the roles um, in the whole innovation adoption process, which is illustrated on the right there. So it's basically having a conversation in which we join the dots, um, to put it simply. Um, and joining those dots is not a network diagram, it's actually um, based on something called agent-based modelling, which allows you to connect both inhibiting and enab enabling relationships and also attach where there are specific levels of influence involved. So the top right hand shows how that conversation emerges with the participant on the right um, telling me, the researcher, about their story and how their story plays out on that um, canvas. Then uh, down the bottom in the middle, there's some examples of real versus ideal results. So we run the model because it's a computer model. And you can see in the real case, there's some hotspots once we run the model. And then asking the participant to say, well, how would you change what really happened to what you'd like to happen? You can look on the uh, next to that for an, uh, what an ideal scenario looks like. And you'll see the hotspots are very different. Um, so things that were um, 
a hot spot in the real case. Uh, for example, in the top right hand corner, um, the role of uh, central systems, which is really where a lot of learning designers live, um, is very small. So if you notice that top right hand corner, real case, tiny little dot. But in the ideal world, that central systems function where the learning designers, the librarians, the um, media um, technology people uh, live is, is, is fully is at 100%. Um, so that's what I've developed. I've got some interesting results, but I've also got an, a, a method for doing it which hasn't existed before. Um, some of the comments I got from the people I interviewed were things like, um, they they liked the model, um, they thought the idea of bringing models and technology together in a conversation um, was a good, uh, good way of reflecting what was happening and how to make change happen. And um, my favourite quote is uh, that so, you know, a couple of people actually said that they had a lot of fun using this method in the research. So um, uh, thank you. and. Uh, uh, I very much uh, see this research as building on the implications from Christine's research and look forward to um, having more contact with this research community in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Irina. That was great. Uh, so keep the applause coming in the chat and questions in the chat uh, or the Moodle forum after this presentation. So next we go to Sarah. If you'd like to fire up your video and mic, there we go, over to you. Hello. Hi everyone. Um, instead of sharing my screen, because I'm going to share a blog post with you, I might just dump the link in the chat so you can all pull it up if you want to. Um, Ta-da. So I don't actually know if this is going to help or hinder the um, conversations about having common language and the being able to articulate and ro uh, roles and things. Um, because my research of like has really taken kind of a sharp left turn. Um, so I'm doing a PhD now in organisational learning and organisational culture. Uh, and out of that has emerged a um, theme of looking into evolving the capabilities of learning design in new directions. Um, and I kept bumping into all of these dots that kept joining up. And eventually they came out in the form of talking about this idea of organisational design. Um, and so you can go through my post and read that there and I kind of draw together the threads of literature that led me there and the um, wading through, I call them other people's disciplines, <laughs> I feel like a bit of an interloper going into business disciplines as someone with an education background. Um, but that's actually part of the conversation is that when I do get um, a raised eyebrow and why would a learning designer be looking into organisational learning, I think, well, they have the same word. Um, but that's not really how university disciplines function. Um, but anyway, it's been a really, um, really critical journey for me um, because these new disciplines have given, they give us all sorts of um, understandings of why organisation, universities as organisations behave the way they do and why change does or doesn't happen in universities and why people in universities behave the way they do and I've just I've had, constantly have these moments of aha um, and particularly the notion of um, complexity theory and systems thinking have um, really helped me crystallise the understanding of the capabilities that um, we already have and then ways that we can apply these capabilities in new ways to act as change agents. There's a lot of um, narrative and previous speakers have kind of referred to these narratives about learning design as active change agents but um, the really um, nitty-gritty how of how that happens tends to get a bit lost because we don't have the conversation about how change works in organisations. Um, so anyway, I'm just, uh, that post was something that you, a few of you probably already um, saw that I just wanted to throw out there and start conversations about the ways that we can evolve our capabilities in different directions uh, towards getting meaningful change to happen. And I wanted to invite people into that conversation and get people's thoughts. And if you all think I'm 
not serving the cause of um, articulating our identities and getting people to understand what we do and having common languages, then that's, um, let me know. Time is up. There we go. <laughs> Thank, thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, one uh, comment, Colin said you've, you've shared with us before, but what uh, I find really good about that is that your story is emerging and, and through your presenting here, uh, it's sharing that emergence. So thank you. Uh, keep the applause coming. And next up is Peter, if he's still here. Yes, all good. I'll share your slide now. Okay, sorry, my blackboard just dropped out for the fourth time this session. Yeah, so. no, gar no guarantees okay. from Blackboard or yours. No, they should be wiped out. Okay, hi everybody. Now, my um, thanks for having me along. Uh, now, what I'm sharing with you today is a very brief summary of a paper that I'm I've been invited to present at ICERI in Seville in November, which is pretty exciting and terrifying in equal measures. And just by way of background, I come not from the learning environment or the learning industry. I come from a corporate background and a technical background. And what I'm looking at is a practical response to some of the needs that have been expressed to me when I was doing work, particularly with uh, the learning environment design and the classroom of the future work at RMIT. And the title is a bit of a mouthful, which is supporting improvement in teaching and learning outcomes with a biometrics driven holistic student engagement analysis tool, um, code name the worm. Uh, now, if you like, you can have the worm as a mouthful. You don't have to be a bird. Some people like them. The three main needs that were expressed during um, my casework were from educators saying they didn't have confidence that their material was being received and they didn't have confidence that it was being um, appreciated and ingested by the audience. So an audience or response system was going to be helpful to them. Uh, I had administrators and student success people talking to me about having a view across a whole student journey rather than across a single subject. And we had the constant theme coming back from students saying, I want you to know what I want before I know what I want. And so I took all this together and we had, uh, I'm no longer with RMIT, but at we had a relationship with uh, AWS Web Services and we had very clear direction to leverage uh, strategic investment we'd made in that partnership. We also had the opportunity to give a work integrated learning experience to some of the computer science students in their last unit. And so I combined the two and asked the students to build me this tool. Uh, the image on the screen isn't particularly good, but we can come to that. What you can see in that image is a web portal that would be in a classroom. And the classroom I'm using as a generic term, same as I'll use teacher as a generic term for an educator. So on the screen, you've got a live video feed that identifies which students should be in the room and which students shouldn't be in the room. And it also contains their name in the bounding box. Uh, you may find it difficult to see, but uh, two of the students on the left have got a green bounding box, which indicates they're meant to be in that session. The system does this by calling back to the scheduling system to find out who is meant to be in that room at that time. What it then does is retrieve their details and their photographs from the CRM and runs a recognition process across it. What it also does is it retrieves the student's risk score. Now that presupposes that there is a risk score in the CRM. The two boxes below that show, uh, sorry, I'll just step back a bit. 
Uh, 30 seconds there, Peter. Okay. So the bottom left-hand box shows individual student engagement trace. The right-hand box shows the aggregated trace for the whole room. And the function of that is so that you can compare that aggregated trace against a lesson plan to identify the spots where the entire audience is picking up or dropping off according to what you're doing. So the opportunity there is to be able to modify content and delivery. The individual traces can then be mapped against the class trace to see where individuals might be having a different journey. And the closing the loop part is if a student falls into either the the, the below average or above average, it raises a case in the CRM for review and intervention if required. And that, of course, is determined by the policy of the organisation. There's no predator response there. Um, it is quite a complex thing. I'd be happy to engage in conversation with anyone afterwards. But one way to break down a silo is to actually build a sledgehammer and build something to show people that it can be done. And I think that my observation, which might be contentious in this space, is there's a lot of research and a lot of talking, not a lot of doing and not a lot of building. And I think if you can build something, it will break down a lot of barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for your presentation. That's great. Uh, last of all, and we have Colin. So Colin, if you would like to screen share, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. Um, ooh. Forgot about that. Uh, I'll be fairly quick because I've um, spoken about this a few times in the past. Um, I also just wanted to show off a neat little feature that I found in Google Slides. Um, so just bear with me for one extra second. What's going on here? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what you can see here is basically the wallpaper. I have had on my computer for about three years now. This is my main research question. And as I've been looking at it in the last couple of days, I'm starting to realize that I want to change it. But let's say that this is the right question for now. What I'm interested in is basically, at heart, what affects the creative working relationship between advisors, so learning designers, education technologists, academic developers and such. So the relationship that we have with academics and also the relationship that we have with management, because I think there's a fairly convoluted triangle there that really shapes how um, we're able to actually achieve things that we want to achieve. So the under, so the questions, the sub questions, I guess, uh, come down to how we perceive ourselves and what we do, how we're perceived, um, what kind of uh, strategies, practices are in place um, to um, let us have more impact and potentially what ones should be used. Uh, on top of that, I think that it'll be useful to gather a whole lot of empirical data about just like the demographics of advisors and who we are and where we are, what roles we're in, how many of us there are, um, how the units are structured. So there's many pieces to this, but it's kind of it in a nutshell. And it touches on a lot of the stuff that uh, other people in the group have been doing. So I'm kind of excited about that. And I'm very glad that so many people are working in this space. And that's probably me. Great. Thank you, Colin. All right, so that was a, a lightning bolt worth of research and I think the recordings will be valuable to sort of get our heads around uh, what people are working on. So thank you to everyone who presented and hopefully that we can continue questions and connections uh, through the Moodle site.